So the money question. What are they talking about? Is, did you jump the restart? <laughs> um, I went. The following is a production of Dirty Mo Media. Hey guys, welcome to a winning edition of Actions Detrimental Post Richmond. Uh, good, good race for the home team. That's for sure. Uh, I'm Denny Hamlin, driver the number 11 Mavis Tires and Brakes Toyota this weekend. And my co-host is Red Vest 311. I'm Jared, um, photographer, social media guy for, <laughs> for Denny Hamlin. Well, that was an interesting weekend. Let's uh, kind of start at the top. We had uh, an Xfinity race where Chandler Smith won. Um, looks like JGR kind of dominated that race. Um yeah, there were some strong runs that kind of caught my eye that, uh, you know, you know, what was your first kind of thoughts of the Xfinity race? I mean, we can go right to the Joey Gase. <laughs> I was going to say that, that kind of <laughs> steals the show. It, it does steal the show for sure. But uh, you got to give props to Chandler Smith and his team. Um, him and Eric Amarola were really, really fast. You know, JGR has you know, kind of had a grasp on that track for quite some time now. Um and so, uh, I, I, you know, I noticed Corey Heim was really, really fast in that, um, in, uh, the SHR car, uh, their same hunt car. Um, they had some struggles on pit road that really did not allow them to, uh, you know, ever really have a chance up front until the very end when they had some newer tires, but, um, strong run by Corey, um, you know, Chandler and his team, you know, they just went up there, took the lead. You know, they had a, a fresher set of tires than, uh, you know, they chose to come in and pit. There was a kind of the strategy play there at the end of the Xfinity race where uh, there was about 20 laps on tires. Uh, half the field decided to stay out. The other half decided to pit. Um, you know, if there was a caution in any one of those last 50 laps, then the guys that stayed out were going to win. If it didn't fall, it was going to be, you know, the entire front running order was going to be the guys that pitted. So that's kind of how that turned out. Uh, but Chandler got by Eric um, in that run and then just kind of pulled away and held him off. So, um, you know, great run. He's he's obviously, you know, really taking advantage of this, this ride in the JGR car for sure. Yeah, Toyota dominated this race. One, two, three, four, besides wow. Sheldon Creed, who obviously DNF'd. Um, but they only have five cars in the race. So other than Sheldon Creed, all their cars finished. At yeah. The front. Speaking of Sheldon, man, it's, they're just not, they're not, I, I don't know that they're running great, but they're definitely not finishing great. Um, you know, my old engineer um, for many, many years, Sam McCauley's the crew chief on that team. And I really had some high hopes for how they'd run and, and they still got plenty of time in the season, but yeah, Sheldon, he said it in his, you know, once he exited the race, I think they had some uh, mechanical failures. Like, he's like, man, we're just, you know, we're just not even remotely where we need to be and we're not finishing very good and had mechanical issues with the car like two or three weeks in a row. So, you know, something to keep an eye on there is to watch for that. How, how impressive is Bubba Pollard's sixth place finish in this race to you? I thought it was very impressive. Um, you know, he, he People saw that he was fastest in practice. A lot of that has to do with how quick you go out. He was one of the very first cars to go out. And Richmond's a track where when it's green, there's no rubber on the right racetrack. It's always significantly faster. So I, I looked at his times and, you know, because I was watching it, because I was interested to see how he was going to do. And he wasn't that fast in practice, but I think that he was definitely getting used to the car. He was for sure getting used to it. And you could see by... By the time he got to the end of the race, he really started to hit hit his stride, and um, it's great to see, you know that uh, you know this a local short track guy. And first, you know you gotta say a, th a huge thank you to Dale Jr. for giving these guys opportunities, right? I mean he's uh, given you know guys that you know, Bubba Pollard doesn't have any big sponsorship that he can you know bring with him to to do this. You know this was Dale Jr. going out in Junior Motorsports, getting a sponsor and saying, hey, I want to put this guy in and and I don't think it'll be the last short track guy that he gives an opportunity to to race I mean similar to Josh Berry right right yeah, yeah. It, you know Stale Jr. taking 
you know, risk upon himself or, you know, really put an emphasis on the sponsorship team to go out and sell a race so he can go then pick whatever driver he wants to participate. So I love he's giving back to the short track community in many, many ways. Um, JR Motorsports, you know, they've you know, really said vocally and, and uh, publicly that, you know, they, they like being that stepping stone to, to some of these drivers. And so drivers, crew members, and many others. What is the transition, the, the difficulty like coming from the late models to an Xfinity car? Because you see guys from other um, disciplines of racing get into NASCAR all the time now. But is late models the closest or, you know, like where, where does that stack up when, yeah, when it comes to all these different It's certainly a lot different than anything Bubba's driven, I would imagine. Um, I don't know how much radial tire experience he has i think that's the biggest thing that i had to get used to going from a late model to uh a truck you know back when i was testing a truck with you know mike stefanik was my driver coach my very first driver coach um but i i got in in a truck and the first thing i didn't you know realize is how different the tire is a radial tire it just it slips really quickly where a bias ply tire you can slide those cars quite a bit, and you see that in late models. So I thought Bubba did a fantastic job adapting, and you just saw him get better and better through the race. And so I bet he'd be chomping at the bit to do this again because he'd be so far ahead of the game next time around. He'd also never been in an Xfinity car or like a green flag pit stop in an Xfinity car, too, yeah. like all those other things. Yeah, I mean, and you don't know how much time he really had to prepare for this. You don't know if he had much, if any, simulator time. Um, so... Uh, regardless of whether he gets to do it again or not, I think it's a, a just a great thing that uh, that Dale Jr. did for him, and he took the he made the most of the situation and and the best of that opportunity. So, shout out to him. All right, rate the Joey Gase throw. Uh, so at the end of the race, we had um, uh, a tift at the end of the race. Uh, towards the end of the race, we had um, Dawson Dawson Cram. Cram ran in the back of Joey, Joey Gase. And apparently uh, Joey, who uh, is a car owner as well, he um, he gave Dawson Cram his very first start, uh, apparently, in the Xfinity Series. And so uh, Joey was very upset, um, obviously. And so he, he crashed his car pretty heavily. And you have to understand that the reason Joey's really upset is that, you know, these guys, I mean, they work on their own cars. They, they, they <laughs> scrounge to get to the racetrack every single week. It's very, very difficult. You know, they're just trying to make a very modest living to say the least, um, you know, by getting to the racetrack every week. And, you know, he mentioned the financial implications. He thought that that was like a 60 grand wreck for him. That's probably, I would say it's probably somewhat true. Um, you know, that car is probably destroyed. And so they've then got to purchase another chassis, you know, fuel cell. There'll be all kinds of different things. Shocks are all gone, rear end housing. So that's why he's upset. More so, you know, when we get upset it, it in the Cup Series, it has no fi financial implications to us other than maybe some prize money that we lost. We don't feel the pain that the car owners feel now i feel it when bubba or tyler wrecks i'm like oh gosh dang it you know i know how expensive that is but joey as a race car driver and an owner is feeling this the double pain which is why he took his anger out on that back bumper and so he got out of his car uh i'm sure you've seen it on social media if you're listening to us he he finishes you know the back bumper's just kind of hanging off there and it's hanging by it's like a it's like Molly's tooth that, that was <laughs> hanging on by a thread, and he just grabbed that thing and ripped ripped it off. And um, he just—it was great because you saw him walking with it, and I and I immediately it caught my attention. I was like, "Oh, he's gonna, he's going to chuck this at the guy." I mean, so he had a lot of confidence that he was going to be able to rip that last little piece off, and which he did. He did, he did uh, and. I thought he he nailed the throw. I mean, he had a he got a little bit of damage to Dawson's car on the right side, like on the windshield. I think it was just the tear off that kind of like kind of split there. But it would have been awesome if he would could have got it inside the car. But that would have been an impossible throw. Oh yeah, right. Like to put it in the driver now that would have been passenger window. That yeah. would have been impressive. <laughs> yeah. 
but I think he did the best he could with slowing up. You know, when you're walking and you're trying to approach another car under caution, and NASCAR really frowns upon that for sure. Hopefully, I mean, I, this is where NASCAR needs to kind of just look away. Um, I know that they have really been adamant on, hey, don't be walking across the track. You know, just stay by your vehicle, let safety personnel. But, I mean, Joey Gase does not need any fines or anything like that. I mean, just give him a call. Say, don't ever do that again. Um, just because, you know, he's already, you know, going to have to repair this car, which is going to cost him a bunch of money. So, let those guys, you know, let that let that be gone. Let us, you know, that doesn't need to be a story for the rest of the week. And um, hopefully they just turned a blind eye on this one. Yeah. Actually, what I'm seeing here for the first time is that Dawson Cram is now selling T-shirts um, with this throw on the front. And then all proceeds are going to Donate Life, which per Bob Pockris is a Joey Gase cause. So okay, you can... Buy a T-shirt, and all the proceeds will will go to charity. No, NASCAR okay. should call him and say, "Don't do it again." But thank you for this viral moment that everyone was talking about. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, they certainly ended up on the good end of that uh, that exchange for sure. But you know, they again, they just they don't want us crossing the racetrack when there's there's cars moving. But I think Joey did a very good job of slowing traffic down, like slowly walking down, and then everyone starts to it kind of makes an according effect where people are kind of oh something's going chi- on here chicken necking like uh, what's going on <laughs> what's who's he mad at is it the guy behind me the guy in the front of me is like, it me yeah <laughs> so it uh he slowly got the field to slow down so he could place that bumper on uh the front windshield of dawson so um that kind of is the recap of the xfinity race Let's go into the cup race. Um, we didn't really have any off-track stuff uh, this past week, right? We had Easter. Series. We did have Easter. That was um, that was fun. Um, What's Easter at the racetrack like? Yeah, I haven't had Easter at the racetrack, I don't think, ever. Um, well, like actually have my Easter egg hunt, things like that. Like yeah. we've, I've always been home and then flew to the track. We had it during, uh, I think, the dirt. Wasn't it the dirt yeah. during yeah, Easter? Bristol. Yeah. I do did you get on your golf course? So I yes. <laughs> yes, I had an opportunity. Did I go to the golf course? No. I, I had an opportunity to This was a whole ordeal, Travis. Yeah. Jordan took the car. I I I, I, I rushed to the bus after practice and qualifying just to see that the car is missing. And what's in the car? My golf clubs. And she's a target buying things for the kids for Easter. And I'm like, hello, you knew I was golfing. And she's like, oh, well, you said you, um, you, said you were golfing at 1.30. I says, just because I say I'm golfing at 1.30, that doesn't mean I can just hit a button and be on the first tee at 1.30. I have to travel there. I need to warm up. Like, I can't. That means I need to leave at 12 or 12.30. Give me a few minutes to warm up, 30 minutes to get there. She's like, oh, I just, when you said you were golfing at 1.30, I just assumed you were leaving at 1.30. I'm like, that's just not the way things work and clearly why you're late to everything. So, so no, I, Travis, I don't know what time it was. I don't recall the timing of all this, but Jordan did get back to the bus and she was like, I rushed back to here so you could go golf. Then Denny was like, I don't think I'm going to go anymore. Because I can I, only play like 15 holes. Right. I, I was going to be short three holes. The guys that I were playing with, they, they teed off at like 105. And I knew that it was going to be a stretch to get there. And then I'm like, oh, I got to get there. Then I got to drive around three holes, go meet up with them. And I'm like, I just want to sit here and watch this Xfinity race. And I had to be back. I had to do a Fox thing. Uh, shoot anyway at 6 30 and i didn't want to be late for that so i just once i lost the momentum i i got you saw i got dressed i was ready i had my golf shoes on and everything sitting well, in the you bus, had your golf waiting. shoes on yeah yes yeah, so why waiting. do you have your golf shoes on you put those on when you get there no golf yeah. shoes nowadays they're like they're like sneakers they're not like you know the spikes that you use they to. are like sneakers yeah they're like sneakers so I was ready, and then the minute I sat down and was waiting for her to get back, 
it was I you, I just lost it. I, I was like, eh. Well, I I guess I'm just not gonna go. So lost mo- lost motivation for sure. And then I was like, well, maybe I can go Sunday morning, play a little eight a.m. golf, be back by twelve. The MRO is having their brunch at twelve to one. Then I could do the Easter egg hunt at one thirty. And then that was like, no, that's just, that's a long day. So didn't golf at all. Damn it. But I appreciate everyone that made an effort to get me on. Uh, quite a few of my friends, um, Noah Gregson actually called me. He says, hey, I'm on the way there. This is on Friday. He's like, do you need to get on? I'm like, yeah, send me the number to the guy. Uh, there were several DMs I saw that, that were offering to get me on. So I appreciate that. I will take advantage and do that. Um, I'll do that uh, in the fall. On to the cup race. On to the cup race. So we started in wet weather for the first time on a points paying. I hate it when they say, oh, this is the first time. It's not the first time. We did it at North Worksboro. The trucks did it at Martinsville. Um, it's just anything that can make headlines. A headline, a history headline. Um, not that anyone cares. But I would just say it was definitely, I was a little timid. Uh, I had a little Fox interview before, and I, I mentioned to him, it's like, you know, this is the tough thing for the probably the 30% of the drivers that actually think they can win today in the dry conditions. We know it's going to be a dry race eventually. And so how hard do you push it when you get to these into the wet weather? Because you can make a mistake that then, well, I'm out of the race, and I never even get to race in the dry and never know, you know, this is an important race coming down the stretch um, uh, later in the season. So I, I want to make sure that I keep my car intact uh, when we get to the dry. So it, it, I never really push it much in the wet. Uh, certainly didn't here, but I held my position. I was happy with just holding my position. Um, but it was interesting for sure. I thought that the cars handled pretty well on it. It certainly did not like paint, um, where you're searching for paint in the dry. You do not want to be anywhere near it in the wet. Um, it's I, just really slick. I thought about that. Um, I was out on a run. I don't know whenever it was this weekend or, and I was running along the side of the road and I'd stepped on the paint and it was wet and I was like, Oh, Denny said you like wanted to put your tires on this and you had more grip, but I don't feel any. Did more you grip. think your shoes were tires? I felt, I mean, kind of the same, same idea, right? Mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Aren't the bottom of your shoes rubber? Yeah, but Aren't it's tires not rubber? hot. It's not hot. Those tires are 200 and something degrees. Well, nonetheless, I thought about what you said in a real life situation, and the paint was slipper, slippier, slipperier. Okay. Have you walked a track that has rubber on paint? Not that I can it, recall. Yeah, it's just do it one time. It's it's pretty sticky. All right. That's it, it. But yes, it's no different than being on a sidewalk when it's icy. It is. You do so, not when it is wet. You do not want to be on it at all. So, I thought all the drivers did a fantastic job. The racing was it looked pretty entertaining, uh, for sure. Um, Travis, you were saying some people did not love. You know, kind of that competition caution when it was thrown. Yeah, I mean, how I it know, was thrown. I hate. I thought it was dumb, and then you drive around for seventeen. Why did you think it was dumb? You guys are, are you not at like your pit? You have pit crews. Like, let's yeah. have real. Like they're like it might not be safe. Tell the drivers to like not drive so fast. Like figure <laughs> yeah. it out. Like if you guys yeah. are athletes, like yeah. But you've also pitted in wet weather rain tires before. We have. Yeah. I listen. I. I, it's hard for me to say. I, I I see y'all's point that hey, we'll just we should just figure it out. But it, it's one car sliding through pit road, take wiping out a crew guy away from being a <laughs> show, and then we're 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 saying that NASCAR made a stupid move, and so I, I I get it. So I I'm not I'm okay with them tiptoeing into this whole wet weather thing. Um, now. I do think they should have let us go longer. Um, like the track was just drying out. And what you were going to see is the tires were going to start to wear wear off and wear out. And then you were going to see the big disparity, disparity in lap times. And you were going to see a ton of passing. Had that thing gone 15, 20 more laps, 
you would have seen passing like you saw at Bristol. Um, so I, I would have liked to have seen them run it a little longer, not not just you know as soon as they see the tracks getting dry, you know, throw that competition caution. You see this in F one at the start of the races. When is somebody going to pit to make that move to the slicks? And get that advantage. So then you would have seen does a doesn't you know a, a driver that doesn't maybe have a chance. All right, let me go for it. Go in pit a little early. Put the slicks on and see if it pays off. Like you would have had more strategy come into play. Yeah, for sure. Um, you, you would have. Um, but I, I don't think, I don't think TV minds a, a break early on. Um, I think that uh, they they're always going to be a little more anxious to get cautions early in races, get some of those commercials over with. Um, you want to, you know, not lose your fan base. Uh, it, it's been proven through data that anytime you have a long green flag run at, at the beginning of a race, it's not necessarily a good thing uh, for your audience. So I think that they did what they thought was the best thing at the time. If they had to do it all over, over again, you heard Elton Sawyer say, yeah, we we do a few things different here and there. Um, but overall, I don't, I didn't have a big problem with it. Um, just because the pit road was very wet for sure. Now we were on wet weather tires. We could have handled it. Yes. Um, I, I'm not really sure. I guess it would have been fine. Um, but man, it's just, it's a risk for sure. Now I'll tell you, they, they wanted us to start in wet weather for sure. They, they didn't even attempt to put the jet dryers on the racetrack to start like they wanted it to be wet um you know i guess the critique was and i heard on on the teardown is that well why didn't you have the pit lane ready then um the reason reason they'd have the pit lane ready is because the cars are sitting there on on the pit lane so you know do you maybe stage the cars differently pre-race so you can work on pit road um, maybe that could be an option. Can you close pit road the first 30, 40 laps and dry pit road while the race is going on? Yeah, but what happens in an emergency situation where someone needs to get to their pit stall? Well, then you handle that, you know. Like what? Like it's not closed, closed, right? It's closed. Well, they can't be driving against trap th three jet dryers coming at their face. Well, what's an emergency? A tire. Like a tire. A car on fire. Like that, well, then the caution comes out and, you know, you open pit road. I thought you mean like a driver has to get out of his car immediately because it's like a health I, emergency. I see what you're saying is that, hey, while the, the racing is going on, why aren't you drying pit road? It, it or just, at least making progress. Because pit crew guys are out there with their squeegees and stuff. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I think it's because you, you got to leave the access to pit road open um, at all times. Let me ask you this. Could they have gone... Just have you guys gone under caution a few laps before it actually starts to give them a, a minute out there to dry it off before the race actually goes green? Yeah, I don't know when they started working on pit road to begin with. Was it at that lap 30? Like, I don't even know had they had they even put jet dryers on on the pit lane until lap 30. If that was the case, then they made a, they should have been on the pit lane while we were warming up like getting ready to go for sure so i don't know that answer so regardless i mean i thought that you know the whole thing worked out nicely i i swear to god i wish we raced tires like the wet weather tires they're they're so soft but before they, we they move, wear out so quickly it's awesome before we move on from this you said you were worried about making a mistake that could cost you the race so you didn't didn't get the race on the slicks now that you say you wish the tires were more like the wet weather tires, like what type of mistake are you trying to avoid? Are you tiptoeing around the racetrack yeah. that much? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's like skiing. Like you're always right on the edge of, you know, busting your ass. It's just, yeah. When, when it's wet, it's just, you, you easily could lock up a tire. It goes straight and you hit the wall. Um, like there was many times where I was crossing over some, um, the, the, the dash lines in the track. And I mean, the car was just spinning big. So it was like, you're just always on edge for sure. So and the so, grip in the wet weather tires is only just enough to yeah, get you around the track. Right. Yeah. It's about, it's about two seconds slower. It was about two to three seconds slower than what we were in the dry. I was actually surprised it was handling the wet weather that well. Uh, but the track did dry super quick. So, um, 
But on a scale to zero to ten, if a slick tire is zero, you have zero grip, zero confidence driving it in wet. What well, is the wet a ten? Wet? You gotta say ten is dry. I'm very confident in how I need to drive. Right in 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 the dry. I would say the wet weather tires is like a it's like a five or six for me personally. So I'm always kind of testing it, and and it, it. It, with enough reps, you know, I surely would get better at it. Um, more drivers, some other drivers are more confident. Uh, they've run in the wet more than I have. Um, so, or they've definitely run in wet in different series. So they feel more confident, confident knowing how hard they can break without locking tires up, how hard they can hit the gas without spinning them. Um, all that comes with time and, and drivers all start to figure it out. And, and really by the time the track started getting dry, I, I felt pretty comfortable in what I, what I had. Right. So as the race played out here um next major event is kyle bush spinning bringing out the caution uh towards the end of stage two um which really kind of he didn't spin right he just hit the wall he yeah hit the wall. yeah he um yeah there was you know some discussion on that for Scrape, sure scraped the wall yeah i mean this is you know this certainly had a factor in some people's days when it came to their strategy they didn't Get their their strategy didn't get to play out because of this wreck or this uh, scrape of the wall, um, but it's uh, yeah I, I don't know. I mean we've we've thrown cautions for cars going up and scraping the wall before, but we've also not thrown cautions when you know some other major <laughs> is going on. So I don't know. I mean it's 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 a tough tough thing to do. Um, certainly could they. You know, saw that the eight was okay, and he came back down in the racing groove and appeared he was taken back off again. Could they have held on a little bit? But I just, you know, just my intuition tells me they probably were at a, a point of the race where they were, you know, we were in the middle of a long green flag run. They they didn't mind a caution. And I, I think they were looking for a little break at that moment. So in previous races, they have decided NASCAR has decided not to throw the caution because it would affect uh, yeah. cycle on pit road. Yeah. So this was a little different because the reason they don't want to affect green flag cycles, right, is that usually that's a window of about four to five laps where everyone will pit. The the interesting thing with Richmond is it did not matter. It, the cycle was 40 laps wide. So you had cars pitting it so many various times that it wasn't really a defined pit road green flag cycle. There was no cycle really defined. So, you know, it wasn't a fuel thing. People were just pitting when they thought it was best for them to pit, whether it be to, you know, to get tires or maybe they're starting to slow down, whatever it might be, right? So I think that that's why they threw this caution is that it it wasn't going to trap a lot of cars a lap down. They saw a car up against the wall. Caution. I don't know that they're really thinking about, well, who's on pit road? Who's going to get screwed by this? Like, they don't have time to really think about that. They just saw a car up at the wall and threw a caution. And, and they knew it wasn't right in the middle of a green flag cycle. Like Larson had already pitted, but it screwed him up. So it's not like he hadn't pitted right. yet where it's in the middle of that cycle. He had pitted, but he needed it to keep going green right, to help him out. Right, right, right. And that's kind of how this strategy works in NASCAR, right? Is that when you go off cycle, and we did it towards the end of the race, is when you go long or you go short, you need it to go, if you go long, you need this thing to go green all the way. If you go short, you want cautions to come out as quick as possible. That's basically the summary of of how this goes so those who pitted right away a caution helps you if you pit late you need that entire time to make it all that ground back up because you think you're going to make it up on the back end of the run that's where the 11 car was really fast at the end of the race is that we went long and then that whole last run we were just marching right to the front but we needed that entire cycle to go green, um, which it did. So uh, that's kind of why, you know, if, if someone probably went long and Larson, I guess, probably pitted, 
that's why they lost track position is because they, you know, they lost, they're, they're willing to lose five, six spots on the front end, knowing they're going to be faster the entire run. And they plan on making those five, six spots up plus more on the, at the end of the run. But when it doesn't go all the way, you can definitely get burnt by a caution. So I wish Freddie was here because I assume that he's probably going to shit all over this decision to throw the caution based on what he said about cautions last couple of weeks. I, I mean, those guys complain about everything over at DBC, but yeah. However, now that I'm listening to you is that you really can't, you don't want NASCAR thinking about driver strategies and when they throw the caution, no. these big windows, because then there really is no strategy. Right. Yeah. If, if if a driver if a team knows that oh NASCAR is not going to throw a you know a ticky tack caution at some point in this sixty lap run, the, then the, you the would... only time we know they're not going to throw a ticky tack caution is right in the middle of a defined green flag cycle where everyone's out of fuel and everyone's coming to pit in yep. this in this three to four lap window. That's when they absolutely do not want to throw a ticky tack caution. And this is not that. This just was not that. No. So. Um, you had, you know, at that point of the race, you know, the kind of the cars defining who was going to be challengers up front. You had the 19, 22, 5, 11, 20 before he had, he had a pit road issue, correct? Speeding, speeding penalty. Yeah. That's, that's such a killer for sure. Um, the, the 23 is up towards the front as well. Um, so it, it was starting to show like who was going to be the contenders for the win at that point. And so. You know, we go into stage three, um, and that's when uh, I think uh, we came out second or third. Third. Uh, third, okay. And then, man, yeah, me and Logano had a side-by-side -side battle for like five laps. I mean, <laughs> we were like inches off of each other, maybe not even. And so that kind of singled out, and um, and so we decided at that point that, okay, we're going to make this a two-stop race. So we pitted on the front end, the, the first pit stop. But then on the second one, we thought that the leaders just pitted too soon. And so uh, we certainly were a little caught off guard by that. But then, you know, it's like Chris Gabriel says, it's just a math equation for us to figure out. Now, you, if you're going to go long, you, you have to do a couple things really well. You have to really be good on the long run. You can't be bleeding time. Now, everyone's going to be slow. So you're going to be slower when you're staying out and there's new and there's cars on new tires. They're going to blow by you, but it's really about, you know, how can you optimize your time? Um, I feel like I do a pretty decent job at that. And then Chris kind of, you know, immediately when he keeps me out there, doesn't say a word to me over a lap later after I saw those leaders pit, I knew what he was doing at that point. And it's like, okay, we're going to go. I mean, we're going to go like every here. Richmond race, isn't it? Pretty much. <laughs> it is. It's, it, but it's, it's them. It's not us. They're the ones who, what we deem is, you know, they're trying to jump each other uh, in F1, as they call, undercut the competition. So they're trying to pit one lap before to then jump in front of this car. And then the clean air is going to take over. Larson and Truex. Right. They're trying to undercut each other. And that just leaves an opportunity for someone running third or fourth, like myself, to say, well, no, we're, we're just going to split this thing up evenly and we'll catch you guys on the backside of that, which we did. So, yeah, it, it, it I thought that we had the race in the back. 30, 40 to go, or 25 to 30 to go. I then saw Truex on the same straightaway or just, he was kind of entering three, I'm coming off two. And I knew the rate of what how fast we were passing everyone was so high. Uh, I think we pitted 10 laps after the bulk of the field. I thought it was pretty much in the bag. So, and it was right until I caught the 22. And, it, you know, it was interesting that the 22 was a couple seconds off of the 19, but the 19 was in some heavy, heavy traffic there at the end. And um, <clears throat> it was slowing him up quite a bit. And the 22 hit the rocket booster button as soon as I got to him. And he picked up speed, and that made it really difficult for me to pass him. Even though I had 10-lap fresher tires, it just did not matter. The aerodynamics were just too much uh, you know, for me to overcome. And, um, yeah, I just was sitting there behind him, and I was frustrated as hell. I was like, damn it, my run has stalled. I thought 
you know, I see we're catching the 19, but I just can't get around this 22. And, um, man, I thought we were, we were going to finish third until that last caution. So, yeah. And he's, he's certainly not going to let you by for the no. same reason that you won the race. If a caution comes out, right. every spot matters yep. at the end of this race. Yeah. Everyone's fighting for all their track position for sure. And so, especially that late in the race, I think I caught him with probably 15 to go or so. He's thinking, well, I can surely air block for this amount of time. Uh, it just so happens he was also catching the 19 along with it. So he's his motivation is, well, not only am I going to hold you off, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go up here and chase this 19 down. So his mentality changes from I'm going to try to hold on to second to I'm going to try to win this race and, and, and catch Truex, which he got close. Yeah, so if you're catching him and then he realized, oh, now I'm catching Truex. Why are you both not? All right, let's go catch Truex together. Like, why? Why he's gaining on Truex with ten laps to go? Why are you also not gaining on him and Truex at the same rate? Because once you get within two car lengths or three car lengths on this car, you just lose all the grip. You know, this it, the the tires don't have enough grip in them, um, or there's not enough variation in lap time. It, it, I, I saw a stat on on X that says this is the closest finish in NASCAR history. Do you know that? Mm, no. First to last. Oh, first to last. First to last. Do you want to know why? We can't even pass f-ing lap cars. Like well, that's everyone I'm runs why? the same speed. Right, but you're cutting in and out of lap traffic, and the you know the guy running seventh, Truex the guy running six. Truex wasn't he? I mean, he was stuck behind. But, Everyone. But you were on that strategy. I was, but as soon as I got to the 22 and I made a, a little bit of a push to get around them, like I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm going to push it here, really be hard on, on the car. And you didn't make it. You were, it got hot. Everything got hot, and then it was over. Yeah, it, it just the, the, the run stopped. We all equalized to the same lap time. So everyone else was just significantly easier to pass up to Joey. And that's yeah, it. yep. Um, if you noticed, we, we passed a lot of cars, and then I had open racetrack. And then I caught Joey pretty quickly in that open racetrack. But then we all started catching lap cars together. So then, you know, if, if it's just me and him on the racetrack, I can always go somewhere different than he's not. So if, say, he's running the high line or the middle line, I can run low. I'll get clean air that way. Or maybe he's running low. I'll just go to the mid. The problem is we started catching lap cars, and he was just going where the lap cars weren't. So then I had no clean – there was no clean air lines to run. And so we've seen this next-gen car repeatedly. We keep talking about it, and we're going to talk about it this week at Martinsville as well. On racetracks that have one groove or one-and-a-half grooves, it does not race well. The only way it races well is because on a mile and a half, you can go – somewhere else you can go run a different line than someone else to get clean air these cars in traffic are horrendous they're the worst car by far in traffic than what we've ever had Uh, a lot of it is because we have you know tires that are pretty damn hard um the one at richmond i looked at the left side wears and they just they're not wearing so goodyear has to get more aggressive on left side tires at least to get more wear in the damn cars because it's um it's we're all equaling out and it's all a tr- it, like i told you when i pushed to get around the 22 i didn't wear the tires out more i just got them hotter and the minute i got them hotter we're done the run was done so it's all about heat in these cars and so um because everyone's tires wear pretty much at the same rate so NASCAR 101, tires get hotter, grip goes away? Yeah, yeah, certainly. We we definitely rather them be cooler than hotter. Uh, and that's why you see lap times where we all fall off a second to a, you know, one point. I think the fall off really was around 1.3 seconds or so from fast lap to end of run speed. Um, that's pretty low for Richmond. I mean, I remember running 26-second lap times there. Uh, a few years ago, um, we were running, you know, tw- you know, low 20, 24s I, at the end when they all were going long and I, or what, when I went long, I was running like 2014s, which is, you know, I was only running 22, 
80s by my, you know, in clean track. So that's not a big disparity of speed. And we're all we're all falling off at the same rate because all of our tires are getting hot at the same rate. Um, so yeah, if you had more tire wear, we it's been proven now. We've seen what ha- what tire wear does at Bristol. It creates huge disparities in speed. So um, I think that you know Goodyear's trying. They're they're coming. They they keep coming back with you know more gauge. They're trying to get more heat in the in the car or in the tire. They need to get way more aggressive than what they've got. This this Phoenix slash Richmond tire needs needs to be considerably more softer than what it is. Did you think this race was going to have a, a caution with two to go? I did not. I had conceded to my third place finish. I was uh, pretty content with it. Um, I was like pretty bummed because with 10 to go, I'm thinking I still got a shot to win. But once, once you know, I realized I'd, I'd pushed all I could get out of it. Um, I, I knew that we were going to finish third. But when the caution came out, I'm like, I'm always torn on a late race caution because you can you definitely can go both ways. You can definitely lose spots, but I was in a good enough spot where I'm like, oh, well, I know my pit crew is pretty damn good. <laughs> so I, as long as I do my job on pit road as well as they do theirs, then we're going to have a shot to come out pretty, pretty good. Now, the advantage for us, too, is that we were racing the 19 and the 22 in front of us that were, did not have the number one stall. Had either one of them had the number one stall, it would have been very difficult for us to overtake them. But for them being just on pit road and normal stalls, it was going to be a heads up competition because the 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 nineteen came on pit road. When you think about how we're lined up, he's the leader, twenty two second. I'm third. I'm probably what's that? Maybe seven eight tenths behind. You know, behind the nineteen. You know that that gap. Um, I'm thinking. Yeah, my pit crew can get a half a second. Maybe I can get three or four tenths through my rolling speed or whatever it might be. And we can be right there side by side with them coming off pit road. But I realized halfway through the pit stall, uh, the pit stop that, oh, wow, this is like three and a half seconds and they've already dropped the jack on the right. So I knew that we were in for a heater of a stop. Um, and then at that point, I'm thinking, Rev it up, rev it up. Do not stall this thing because I, I, the most embarrassing thing I could have possibly done is those guys knock out like an eight five, and then I stall, <laughs> leaving the pit stall. So <laughs> that'd be embarrassing. That would have sucked so bad. So I made sure I didn't do that. So if anything, I overread it, spun the tires a little bit too much. Um, but yeah, they, I could see their excitement, and I could hear Chris Gapehart clearing me out, and I knew because they had pitted before me then mm-hmm. you hadn't seen him pass yet. i hadn't seen him pass me so this was ours so this was your pit at- crew 8.99 truex's was 10.29 logano 10.29 yeah it's uh i mean we, we and got that was a, not we even got the fastest of the day they had an 8.79 earlier in the day yeah well i mean it's really difficult to i mean the money stops when they know that this is for the race win i'm sure the pressure is super high but this team they've been together now for three years uh, they've gelled uh, amazing. I mean, this is one of the youngest groups on pit road. It just FYI, this used to be Truex's pit crew. Um, he wasn't really happy with them um, a few years ago. Uh, so they made a change, but they were really young. I mean, they're already, I, I looked last year, their average age. I think if you take out the fueler, it's like 27 years old. It's, they're very young when you think about how, how uh, aged some of the pit crews are. Uh, especially the fast ones. Uh, but now this is three years in a row they got to work together. So they're they're finally hitting their stride, and it couldn't come at the, a better time for me, for sure. You mentioned the, the pit stalls for each of these cars. This was actually then the perfect storm of a caution for you because if it wasn't uh, a caution for the five car, he has a number one pit stall. Right. Surely exactly right. he wins that race off pit road because he was in fourth. Oh, he was? Yeah, he would have had a... Yeah, had they knocked out at eight five? Yeah, yeah, they they probably. I mean, I don't know how many lap cars were between us though. That was the only X factor, right? Because you can't pull up to pit. Sure. So if if we had three lap cars between us, you know, the gap would have been even more. Uh, but but yeah, he he would have been in the picture for Ma- sure. Major factor, nonetheless. Major factor 
But man, talk about a guy that that things worked out for him. I mean, that whole you go from spinning to gaining. Yeah, and the guy that's this spun is the theme of the year, right, Travis? <laughs> Everyone just spins out. You end up better. So Denny Hamlin special. <laughs> yeah, surely. Uh, but no, I mean, I you know you kind of look at that accident and you could see where. Now that was a very vulnerable spark part of the racetrack where Larson got really loose off of turn four. You could see he got clear of Bubba and then started getting loose and then checked up and then Bubba was right on him. And so um, it was good to see Bubba come over there and at least apologize to him. And you know whether he's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. At least you show that like, hey, sorry about that. Yeah, I didn't mean to get into you. But uh, Kyle looked like he was – he was pretty happy after the race. Like he was, you know, he, he got, well, yeah, he's got spun out with two to go and <laughs> still finished. Well, what do you think of the caution though? Being called. Was at it quick? The end? Oh, it had to be caught. He was spinning through the infield. It seemed like he gathered himself really fast. I, I only saw the slow-mo. Sorry. I, I didn't see it in total real time. Um, I but, think that's a caution no matter what. Yeah. He's heading towards the inside wall. I, it's a caution. And, I, I it, it has been 15 weeks. I thought I saw uh, Trey Ryan 99 on X. Give him a shout out. He's a great stat guy. Um, 14 or 15 weeks since we've had a green white checkered. NASCAR was ready. <laughs> <laughs> they're 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 ready for one, um, especially at Richmond, right? I mean, it was a track where we all could catch each other, but we all just can't. No one could pass. And and you saw I saw Parker Kligerman, uh uh, say during the race he was he was tweeting during it he says he says well all the leaders are in the screen now we haven't seen anyone pass today but at least they're all in the screen they're all so there. i mean that's that's what you know jim wants 101 right there it's just more cars in the picture now they they're not going to pass each other but <laughs> they're going to make you believe they can yeah were you um, surprised that uh a couple cars didn't try to stay out and see if they could do I was actually surprised there were no two tire stops. Yeah, I, I was a little shocked with that for sure. Um, but I was I was loving the four tire call. As long as everyone took four, then we we're going to be able to dictate that restart. So NASCAR got their green white checker they were looking for because now it's the only thing that they're talking about. Yep. So the money question: What are they talking about? <laughs> did you jump the restart? Um, I went I went pretty early in the zone. What? I, no, no, that it's a you're going to continue your thought. No, it's a zone. It's a restart zone, right? Anybody know what the definition of zone is? I bet Josh Wise does. He he uh, had pretty good couple of tweets. What did Josh Wise say? Oh, Josh that. Wise is the Chevy driver coach. Um, he's the one that kind of all these guys go to. He's the teacher. For all these Chevy drivers, uh, he's made a hell of a career for himself outside of racing. He raced for many, many years, and he, him and Scott Speed have just done a tremendous job um, being driver coaches for the whole Chevrolet group. But what do you say? I got this little thread here. So NASCAR has always allowed flexibility on the restart box entry. There would be dozens of wins overturned if they had a hard line in this. Late race, green, white, checkered. It's well known, especially in the Cup Series, fire early. For those asking why there's a painted line, I'm not referring to that as the hard line for those reading that literally. In my opinion, I think flexibility is needed, and Denny didn't stretch this any more than what we see in other weeks. Just to be clear to many other responses, I am not responsible for the creation or enforcement of the rules, only offering an observation. Did he, did he have an attorney write that up? <laughs> That was really well said. A uh, fan said not to mention Truex backed up to try to get a good run for himself. Yeah. And he calls himself, and Josh so, said exactly, if there isn't some soft flexibility on the box, P2 can solve for all the uh, leaders' launch options. Yeah. It's as if me and Josh are reading the same book, for sure. Um, I, uh, I agree with him. I mean, I clearly agreed with him because uh, certainly if you fire in a zone that they know you're going to fire – in um a sign city zone in an, in a spot if they know you're going to fire in a spot they can actually fire before you and it, it on tv will not look like they did um i concede that 
uh, on TV, it looks worse than what it felt like in the car. Now, a lot of the reason of that is that when I'm restarting the race, I'm not looking at the flagman. I'm not looking at my dash. I'm not looking at anything. All I'm looking at is my mirror and my side peripheral. So all I'm doing is trying to time this person's run. You know, at what speed is the outside car going? And then I'm looking in the mirror to see, okay, how close is the car behind me? And clearly, Joey is laying back. And, you know, if we really want to get into techni technicalities, you should not be laying back. But he laid back enough to where I could see him start to creep towards me. Now, at that point, I'm thinking in my head, I'm not going to let him roll to me and then as soon as the gap closes take off because then he's got an advantage he's going to be pushing me he's going to pull out of line i've you know he dictated the restart not me and the same with the 19 i saw him he was back on my right around my door and i saw him creeping forward and just just understand that every mile per hour that you start quicker you're that much that you're that same mile per hour faster all the way until we lift. So all the way to the, down the front straightaway, you've got that one mile per hour advantage. So I don't want to give up the advantage of being the leader. So at that point, I see I see the restart zone. I'm coming off of turn four, and all I'm doing is looking mirror side, mirror side. And, and I guarantee you can go to my in car and you'll see my eyes just kind of bouncing between the two. And I'm mostly looking to the, to the right and I'm looking at the left front fender on the 19 car. And at that point, I just, when I see him starting to creep, I'm like, I take off. So I don't see where I'm at in the zone. And so I concede definitely that it is a few feet early. Um, so but it's again, I don't think that's ever been a hard line like Josh is talking about. Many, many late race restarts have been fired really early um, because if you if you wait until you get to the zone, you lost all your advantage to the cars that are around you because they know he's going to fire then. OK, I'm going to slow my speed down now and creep it up. So that way I'm running a couple miles an hour faster than him when I get to that zone. So I tried to negate the advantage that those guys were trying to get on me on that last restart. So what are you going to say to, to Truex or what is Coach Gibbs going to say today in the competition meeting? How is that going to go over? I, I asked Truex, I says... Oh, so you already talked to him. I, I asked, I texted him, I says, am I missing something of why you're so upset? Um... I don't know. I, well, he I, didn't win the race after leading 200 plus laps. And I, I'll paraphrase it for you. He says, "No, we're all good. I just lost my mind." Um, that's all he's. That's that's what he said. Paraphrasing. He's like, "No, I just. You're fine. I just. I, I lost my mind there for a minute." And and I and my response is that well, rightfully so. He, he obviously deserved to win the race. He was he had the race won, um, but surely that was a bad five minutes for for him and the 19 team yeah he so. then doored larson a few times yeah he was bumped he, into the rear view after the checkered yeah um travis you asked me you, you showed me a video um when they were coming out was that a green flag cycle where the five kind of veered out and cut him off on the exit i believe so on the pit road he kind of just get, went up pushed him up a little bit and i think you Kyle would have ha had him anyways but I didn't know if that kind of pissed off Truex, and he's like, you know what? I'm in a mad mood. Yeah. Like, I'm not happy with Larson already. Let's yeah. get him, and then I'll get Danny. Like, well, we got to understand too that you know Truex has dominated this race. I think six times did I read that? Six times he led over a hundred laps. You're she's shaking her head. Um, six times he led over a hundred laps and did not win this race. So I, I mean, that sounds like Martinsville for me. It's it's painful. It sucks because you do everything right and then something out of your control takes you out so like i said to him understandably so like you you deserve to be upset so there there will probably be no beef or whatnot in the competition mm -hmm. meeting today no i mean i think it's just you know james small his crew chief is, is a very emotional guy and i think 
Martin gets emotional behind um, in in the headset. Nothing like Ryan Blaney. I, he he loses his psycho. He, he goes psycho when he gets in the car for sure. But it's it's entertaining for us to hear <laughs> those things. It, it 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 really is when they kind of play it back on Radioactive on Tuesdays on Race Hub. There's your plug. Um, but it's uh, Martin just he had the race slip right through his hands, right? And it's nothing that he did. He didn't do a damn thing wrong. He just, he got ping-ponged around. You know, he had an unfortunate caution. He got let down a little bit on pit road. I don't know whether they, they let him down or they just, we just beat them, right? I don't know. Where do you characterize this? I, I think that we just beat them, right? I wouldn't say that they lost it more that we won it. I mean, they had a slow, that final pit stop mm-hmm. was slow. Yeah, I, it looked like all the times on the uh, pit lap tracker was a little slow. I think the official times were like an 8.6 for us and a 9.9 for those other two guys. Still, 9.9 is very middle of the road for sure. Um, but you're you're leading the race. Usually a 9.9 will keep you there. Uh, but I, I don't know. I need to look at kind of all the metrics to see. Yellow line to yellow line. What? How did we all do? So it's more than just a pit stop for sure. I don't know if you've noticed this, but since the start of 2024, you've your villain era um, trajectory has has taken more of like a hero era in recent weeks. Like I feel like you've had more cheers. I than thought booze, so too. But we're going to Martinsville next week. <clears throat> you are going to get booed the shit out of now really? after this. Yeah. Why would I do wrong? What I you cheated. Mean? You cheated. <laughs> Come on, man. I I agree with you. I thought Richmond was a nice, nice crowd. I appreciate you, Richmond. I, I saw a lot of DH gear, uh, a lot of all-in shirts. Um, yeah, hometown cooking, man. I love 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 Richmond. Just stop drawing mustaches on Denny. That's all. Yeah, I I saw someone from NASCAR posted an update. There was there's graffiti all over my picture, but. I thought I think that's entertaining. Uh, update after last night. Yeah. Oh, Did you, have you see seen it? it? No. Yeah. There's. I'll I, have to find that. There's there's a lot of stuff <laughs> <laughs> on there, but there's a lot of like positive messages on on it as well, and I appreciate you. Just so you know, when you when you wrote those positive messages, those. Uh, that that we did see. Jared had me stop in that tunnel. He's like, "Hey, this is where that picture is, where they drew a mustache yeah. on you." I was like, "Oh, well, let's stop and see it." Um, this was after the Xfinity race. Everyone had was was gone. Um, I I saw a lot of good messages in there. For I mean, sure. there was there was some negative too, but there was some negative from other drivers that Absolutely. was pretty obscene as well. Absolutely. <laughs> so I think that uh, I didn't realize that that is a Richmond thing where. Uh, uh, I talked to Julie, the track, track president. She's like, yeah, they they typically write on the, our walls and we always kind of repaint them, but I think we're just going to kind of let this go at this point. Right. As I told you, this has <clears throat> been an, a thing for the last handful of years. You always have a face. Someone always draws a face on you and they erase it and they draw it back. Okay. Always. Well, well, if someone, if you see that I've got a, a face that's very, I, I know my face is unappealing as it is, but it, could someone go over it and make it more appealing? Maybe you see like they put a, a not very handsome mustache on me and you're like, oh, that's not a good look. Let me pretty this up. Let me fill that in. You know, so maybe my fans could help me out there. Perhaps. Yeah. It's a request, I guess. So, yeah, I saw that. Uh, it was cool. I did think the Richmond crowd. Yeah. I thought that when I came out for intros, it was 50-50. Yeah, I mean, you doing the the red carpet walk to driver intros. I mean, you can't, you don't. There's not enough time yeah. for you to stop and sign. I every signed a girl's that's, face. Yeah, I have a great photo of that. It's all. Is it still on my story? It should be right. It uh, uh, yeah. this time of day. Yeah, yeah. this there'll be a this, photo. This was a first. Too. This was a first for me. I've never signed. I've signed a forehead. That's weird. But this this. Uh, very beautiful girl says, why don't you, I want you to sign my cheek. I want my cheek signed. And the bad part is I didn't give her a very good signature. Uh, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Going to Martinsville. You, uh, you think we're going to swing this crowd back to 70, 30, 80, 20, 90, 10. 
<laughs> You're already not well liked there to begin. Um, well, hey, I'll appreciate any cheers I get this weekend. Um, I'll appreciate the booze as well. So keep them coming. This uh, review. You got something Go else? ahead. Now, give me a review. This review comes from Jimmy Clements. Love the podcast. It's my favorite. And anytime I see a FedEx truck, I say Denny Hamlin is the man. Oh, thank you. Uh, Jimmy Clements. It's not uh, Jeremy Clements' dad, is it? No, Maybe. probably not. Um, today, we were leaving the airport. Uh, we just we flew back this morning. It was too late to bring the kids home last night. And it was so late anyway. Um, Molly was sitting in the truck. And we were right next to uh, a FedEx plane. She's like, Daddy, FedEx. I said, yeah, what's in there? She's like, boxes. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's pretty much right. So I, I, I love that, hearing that from fans that like every time they see a FedEx truck or whatever, they think think us. Uh, you will see, by the way, FedEx, you're going to see a lot of them in the playoffs. You know, they, they know that we, we make the playoffs, we make runs in the playoffs. So you'll see a lot of FedEx cars when it comes to the playoffs. By the way, that's good on Molly because there was another plane sitting there and she must not have recognized that one. Not at all. And it was poo poo brown. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to Richmond or go to Richmond. Let's go to Martinsville and get another one. We need another one. Be sure to rate, review, follow wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe to Actions Detrimental on YouTube. All right, appreciate y'all tuning in. We'll see you next week. Check out Dirty Mo Media on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram.